We're trying to design rules of international cooperation and governance that would that where countries would be working together to help each other do the wind down, to hold each other accountable to a global carbon budget. And a treaty can be binding. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're having conversations about regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. How can we build an economy that's in service to life? Brought to you by Ma Earth, you can find all of our conversations at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's guest is Zipporah Berman. She is the co-founder of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, or Fossil Fuel Treaty for short. In this discussion, we go deep into what is the Fossil Fuel Treaty, why it's so important, how global adoption is progressing, and Zipporah's vision for the sunsetting of the fossil fuel industry. The stakes are high, and Zipporah brings a fierce commitment to the work to match it. Let's dive right in with Zipporah Berman. Today we are here with Zipporah Berman. She is the founder and chair of the Fossil Fuel Treaty and the co-founder of Stand.Earth. Thank you so much, Zipporah. Thanks for having me. And we're here just wrapping up Climate Week. I know you've been very busy, really appreciating the time. How has it been so far for you? It's been pretty exciting, actually. I think I've been coming to Climate Week since it started. I can't some sometime around 2009, I think. It, anyway, it's a very long time. Mm-hmm. Feels like a very long time. And for a lot of that, I felt like the conversations I felt like we needed to have were only on the fringe. And the conversations about how human rights and indigenous rights intersect with climate change, the conversations about how do we constrain the actual production of oil, gas, and coal that's threatening biodiversity, that is threatening our climate, that is the core of the climate problem. And I often would raise that with people organizing at Climate Week, and they'd say, well, you're welcome to organize a side event. Mm -hmm. And this year... Uh, the climate group endorsed the project that I'm working on, the Fossil Fuel Treaty, from the main stage and invited me to speak on the main stage. And and it was just a crazy week. And, mm. and, I, and it's such a relief to see people starting to have an honest conversation about the problems that we face mm. and not just um, incremental conversations about in my in my mind, the conversation for the last decade just hasn't last three decades just hasn't been honest mm-hmm. about the core of the problem and about what we face and about how to fix it. Mm. It's a refreshing take because a lot of the takes I'm seeing online coming out of Climate Week are saying like, you know, it's been all talk and now we're starting to move towards action. And what you're saying is actually no, the talk has not even been the right talk to date. No, look. For 30 years, we've been talking about climate policy as though the only thing we need to do is to constrain emissions, to constrain pollution, Mm. that we need to reduce the demand for fossil fuels. We need to set emissions targets. Um, And then somehow the conversation even got distorted into concepts of net zero that lead people to these complicated conversations about offsets and carbon credits. And yet, while climate policy is complicated, what's not complicated is that the carbon trapped in our atmosphere that is smothering the earth today, that is causing the wildfires and the, and the floods and the storms across this planet, come from three products, oil, gas, and coal. And that's what we need to talk about. We need to talk about oil, gas, and coal, whether we can replace them how we can replace them, how quickly we can replace them, and how we're going to cooperate to stop them expanding right away. And that conversation, I actually remember being at an event where a government official came up to me. It's a climate event. And they said, Sapora, people are saying it's kind of rude that you keep talking about fossil fuels. Rude. Mm. 
because the fossil fuel industry has spent 30 years trying to make the conversation about their products invisible. Mm. And they've been successful in doing that. And that stopped this week because of the work of indigenous people and in the heart of the rainforest opposing those projects and, you know, persistently for decades because of people marching in the streets, over 600,000 people marched in the streets on Sunday around the world, mm -hmm. calling for an end to fossil fuels. Um, I think because of the work of the Fossil Fuel Treaty, the, the project that I'm working on now and many organizations all over the world really demanding that we have an honest conversation about what needs to happen. And I've been watching this shift really for the last maybe three years where the terms fossil fuels are starting to come into the international debate now where they weren't before. And this week to me felt like a tipping point. Mm -hmm. So what is the Fossil Fuel Treaty? The Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty is an idea, it's an initiative, and that has now been supported by six nation states calling for a fossil fuel treaty on the floor of the United Nations, um, and actually, um, actually eight, because here at Climate Week we'll have had two, two countries announce uh, their support, Timor-Leste and Antigua and Barbuda, are now joining the other six nation states that have called for it. The idea of the treaty is this, that the Paris Agreement doesn't even include the words fossil fuels or oil, gas, and coal. I still remember when I searched the agreement trying to find how does the Paris Agreement constrain the protection of fossil fuels. The fossil fuel treaty is based upon the understanding that for 30 years we've been trying to cut with one half of the scissors with only policies designed around demand and not mm. around constraining supply. Our governments have been setting targets and creating agreements to constrain emissions and not at all touching supply. So right now we're on track to produce 110% more oil, gas, and coal between now and 2030 than can ever be burned under a 1.5 degree scenario. So let me say that again. We're on track to produce more than double what can ever be burned on the surface of the planet or it will burn us. Just by 2030, too. By 2030. And and so it's crazy. When I first actually started figuring it out, because I worked in the tar sands in, in Alberta mm. for years. I'm Canadian, and I was advising the Alberta government on designing climate policy. And, and I remember sitting down with them and saying, well, you can't just constrain emissions. You also have to constrain production, because if we're just constraining domestic emissions, you're not counting the barrels of oil you're producing and exporting. And... And the response to that, by the way, by several prime ministers to me has been, well, if we, if we also constrain production and emissions, there might be double counting. Would that be so bad? Mm. Every single year for 30 years, we've missed our targets. Mm. Our emissions globally are still going up. And people are dying every day because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Thousands are losing their lives and their livelihoods every day. 10,000 people in Libya last week in the floods. A person is dying every 36 seconds in the Horn of Africa right now because of the famine, because of the, the, the drought. And, and so the whole idea that we can't have double counting or that we shouldn't be constraining supply, we shouldn't be doing everything we can right now is crazy. Mm -hmm. But it exists because our climate policy has been built on this theory that we'll have emissions reductions and policies, zero emission buildings and zero emission cars and carbon pricing. So the price of carbon will go up, mm -hmm. demand will go down, and the market will constrain supply. The market will fix everything, except it's not working. Mm -hmm. It's not working at all. It's certainly not working fast enough to keep us safe because the market's distorted by fossil fuel subsidies and the power of the fossil fuel industry. The IMF is reporting that our governments gave the most profitable companies on earth $7 trillion last year. That fossil fuel subsidies increased last year, $13 million a minute now. So the idea of the fossil fuel treaty is that we need a new bold proposal that is commensurate with the scale of the problem, where governments cooperate to set new rules 
to push back against the fossil fuel industry, to regulate production, to stop expansion, manage a wind down in a way that is equitable and fair, and then fast track solutions. Those are the three pillars, basically, of the fossil fuel treaty. And, and we've started to get a lot of government support for the idea, especially from governments of Pacific Island nations, who are the most vulnerable on earth to climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look, some people say that it's too big, it's too bold, we don't have time. But I think what's really critical at this moment in history is we don't have time for more of the same. We have to try something different. And, and I think that the, the fossil fuel treaty is providing a framework for how countries can make a plan to ensure that we don't produce more than we can use. It's kind of crazy right now that so much money is going into digging up more mm -hmm. oil, gas, and coal when we already have more on the surface of the planet than we can ever use especially when we need that financing to be going into solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially when, if we can stop the, the new fossil fuel projects now rather than later, it's just so much easier because once there's investment and momentum and you know all of that forward-looking incentive structure by these companies and their shareholders, which happen to be things like pension funds. And now you want to hurt the pension funds of retirees and teachers. And, you know, like the, the system has a way of just continuing on. Whereas at the moment, if we can actually constrain the, the, any sort of new supply coming, receiving that investment at the outset, it's, it's going to be much easier than, than trying to do it later. Exactly. I want to ask you about you know, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. How did you and your collaborators arrive at this frame, which I presume is a nod to the Non-Proliferation Treaty for Nuclear Weapons? Um, and, and both that parallel I'm curious about, and I'm also curious about um, what is a treaty and why a treaty framework? We learned a lot from reaching out to academics and diplomats and lawyers around the world who have played a hand in creating different treaties, chemical weapons bans, landmines, nuclear nonproliferation. We were particularly inspired by the three pillars of nonproliferation and the idea that when the those treaties were created, they didn't just create new global governance and international cooperation and rules. They shifted a social norm. Mm. And culture matters. Norms matter. Mm -hmm. So I'm old enough to remember growing up in the where nuclear weapons were um, what were going to protect us from the big scary red scare, you know? And... And then the awareness dawning as a result of nuclear campaigns that we already had enough weapons on the planet to destroy the entire planet six times over. And the shift that happened when we started realizing that the stockpiling of nuclear weapons was actually the greatest threat to us all. And, and then the campaign, Nuclear Free Cities, cities calling on countries to agree on nuclear nonproliferation, and the shift that happened there. That's what we need to do with fossil fuels. Mm. Because no matter where you lived, you've grown up in the last 50 years thinking that fossil fuels are prosperity. Certainly in Canada and the United States, the, the geyser of oil is pouring money. You know, that's the kind of images we grew up with. Mm -hmm. This is fossil fuels mean freedom. They mean cars and freedom and turning the lights on. And, and so that idea of prosperity is very sticky, and it's something that the fossil fuel industry uses to make us think that we don't have a choice, that we can't move to cleaner and safer systems, even though renewables are now cheaper, mm. and they're certainly safer. Um, and we know how to electrify so much of the way that we need to run the world for heating and for travel. Sure, there are some uses of fossil fuels we haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. Aviation, for example, but it's 2% of global emissions. The majority of uses for fossil fuels we now can, can shift. But the other reason was because fossil fuels today are, are our weapons of mass destruction. 
they not only are responsible for 86% of the emissions trapped in the atmosphere, but one in five people on the planet who die a premature death today die because of air pollution due to fossil fuels. Oh. One in five people. Fossil fuels are the greatest cause of death. Our kids' asthma, the, and that's not even looking at the impacts of fossil fuels on our water. Mm. And and we don't really realize that that's what we've cre what well, that's what we've created the cumulative impacts, and so this social norm shift is important, and it's also important because when you look at the history of other treaties, often the big producers, the countries that are most responsible for the problem, they don't sign, mm -hmm. but they've stopped stockpiling, landmines, chemical weapons nuclear weapons, even countries that didn't stop, didn't sign, they mm. stopped because a social norm shift happened where it became unacceptable in foreign policy for a country to be saying that they're stockpiling this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do with fossil fuels. So we were really inspired by history and learned a lot from history in designing the fossil fuel treaty and framing it uh, around non-proliferation, though I think the design of the treaty now as we're starting to get into text with some of the countries and starting to get into some of the issues that will be addressed under the treaty, I think we're learning more from landmines and chemical weapons than we are from the structure of, of the nuclear treaties. Mm -hmm. But why a treaty? Because we need countries to cooperate. So why do we need countries to cooperate? Well, first of all, it's a global problem. We all know that about climate change. Right. But when it comes down to fossil fuels... What we realize is that some countries have the capacity to stop expanding production and manage a wind down. Um, they have more capacity than other countries. Mm -hmm. Some countries are more dependent. So look at Colombia. 60% of Colombia's gross domestic product is coming from fossil fuel production and exports. So if you say you have to stop expanding and manage that down, well, how quickly do they have to manage it down? Look at Ecuador. They're drilling for new oil in the heart of the Amazon right now just to feed their debt. So we need to look at those issues. We need to look at equity and fairness and manage a wind down of who gets to produce and how much. Because today, who gets to produce what fossil fuels, where and how much is just designed, it's decided by the markets. And if we leave it up to the markets, then there's no justice. There's no mm. equity embedded in the markets. There's no carbon budget embedded in the markets. We know then that, that we'll use too much because that's what's happening today. So we're trying to design rules of international cooperation and governance that would that where countries would be working together to help each other do the wind down, to hold each other accountable to a global carbon budget. Mm -hmm. And a treaty can be binding. It can be binding a lot of ways, but one of the ways we're looking at right now under the under the fossil fuel treaty is with trade agreements. And 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 that could force countries to to really hold them to not expanding mm -hmm. the problem. Because right now, you have all these wealthy countries especially talking about being climate leaders. I'll take the example of my own, Canada. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau here in New York talking about being a climate leader. He's done some great things. We do have an economy-wide carbon tax. He's reducing fossil fuel subsidies. It's great. But he's also approving new oil sands projects, LNG, and fracking. It's not a transition if we're continuing to grow the problem. And the science has been very clear. Look at the IEA, look at the IPCC, sorry, the IPC. There's no new projects fit. We already have enough. New fossil fuel projects and infrastructure don't fit under a 1.5 degree scenario. We need absolute emissions and production decline. Yet Biden just approved Willow, a new oil drilling. The UK is looking at 100 new oil blocks in Rosebank. And Trudeau is, is, is approving more projects. In fact, it's five wealthy nations Right now, Global North wealthy countries are responsible for more than 50% of the expansion in fossil fuel development that's planned between now and 2050. Yeah, okay. There's a lot there. I mean, I, I find that that articulation is so compelling of how market-based approaches don't uh, really integrate 
an equity or justice lens. If we have the global north as broad sweeping statement, responsible for far more of the emissions and ecological destruction of the past than the global south. And the future production. And the future production commitments, at least. Um, then if you create this kind of magical marketplace that is this free market where everything's just traded and there's a price on carbon and we increase the price uh, enough to decrease the, the demand and that somehow is going to, to solve the problem, uh, what we are doing, though, is putting a lot of countries in a, a much different position of their own trajectories and pathways and development curves. And we're not really loading any of the responsibility on the wealthier countries for their part of, of the emissions to date. Um, so, yeah, the reason I emphasize that is because I meet a lot of well-intentioned, very intelligent people pursuing market-based approaches. And I think that that particular point is very compelling to to integrate. Um, do you want to say any more on that before I ask your next question? I want to reinforce that we've had 30 years of trying to do market-based approaches on climate change and it's not working. Mm -hmm. That we have experienced unprecedented intensity of heat waves, heat domes, and wildfires and flooding this year. And that it's only going to get worse that what we're experiencing is not a surprise. When you look at the projections, mm. we knew decades ago, and Exxon knew over 30 years ago, that we would be experiencing what we're experiencing today if we allowed that much carbon to get trapped in the atmosphere. We knew. They knew. They denied it. They lied. They spent billions on trying to delay, successfully delaying and weakening climate policy. And if you look at what's coming up in the court system now, in the California case where Gavin Newsom is and California is suing big oil or any of the other climate lawsuits that are coming up around the world, and if you, if you look at the detail embedded in those, what you see is that was their strategy. Mm -hmm. The companies who stand to benefit the most from us not constraining fossil fuel production have been pushing these market-based policies that allow credits and offsets and abated fossil fuels, as though you can abate fossil fuels, even though the data shows us mm. that their carbon capture and storage plans aren't working. Mm -hmm. They're not storing the majority of carbon. In fact, they're about, I would say, looking at all the projects added up, it's about 80% less storage than they promised. Yeah. The system has been rigged to, to allow them to continue to, span, to expand and give us hope mm -hmm. that it's okay, that we can have our cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, people are literally dying. Right. Not just in the global south, not just on the little... Pacific Islands that are dealing with the typhoons that no one seems to care about here in North America. I come from Vancouver, Canada. And two years ago, we had a relentless heat dome for 48 hours. And over 700 people died in Vancouver in 48 hours. A billion sea creatures boiled in our oceans. I walked down to the oceans and they were just tossing up dead carcasses of fish and shellfish. The stench was like some kind of thing out of a nightmare. And then this year, our forests were on fire from May through to now. Millions and millions and millions of hectares burned, 1.5 billion tons of carbon, choking people with the smog right here in New York from the Canadian wildfires. It's not working. So it's insane to think we can continue on that system. And, you know, when you look at the wildfires, it's also kind of crazy that people think we can have offsets through forest protection now, which allow us to continue to burn more fossil fuels. Offsets require permanence. Mm. And our forests are in fire. The forests are in fire in northern Canada, some of the wettest forests in the world, right? <laughs> but it, the permafrost was on fire in northern Canada, 200 feet down. 
it's crazy what's happening right now on this planet. And so to say that we can somehow just say, we're going to protect this forest, we're going to call it an offset, go ahead and pollute. Mm -hmm. We passed the option for that mm -hmm. probably 15 years ago. And now where we're at is we need absolute emissions and production decline mm -hmm. of fossil fuels. And, and that's the bottom line. And we have to figure out how to do that. We have to regulate the fossil fuel industry. We have to stop pretending that we can do it through voluntary measures or through the market. And governments need to constrain the production of these products because what we produce today is what we use tomorrow. Yeah, I guess, I mean, my only caveat or I guess additional piece that I, I feel I hear from people working on the market-based approaches is um, we need all of the above and that it's not a permission to pollute. It's we need to cut emissions and we need to make sure that we're creating funding mechanisms for people who are protecting forests. And as it stands today, it's difficult you know, you do work in the Amazon, for example, you know, a lot of folks are struggling to get conservation dollars just to hold back the tide of development. And people are trying to use things like carbon or ecological credits to provide those funding mechanisms. So yeah, I'm just curious in terms of the nuance around that, not as a permission to pollute, but as a vehicle for funding restoration and protection. Well, what's the credit for if it's not a permission to pollute? What are you getting a credit for? Well, the people receiving the credit are getting a credit for protecting or growing the forest. Right? Of course, but who's buying it and why are they buying it? So that they can pollute more. That's why credits exist. So I'm not saying we don't need to support communities. Maybe. I mean, I, I live on a farm. We have a tractor you know, we use fossil fuels. Like we're going to have to, right, okay. we're going to have to transition. So personal use and, and industrial use that is essential, having a credit mm. that, so that means that we need to have rules for who gets to buy it. Right. And we need to get, have rules for who gets the credit. And honestly, uh, the only, the only system that I have seen so far on the planet that actually is doing that well mm. is a new system that's being designed by Dr. Tracy Osborne out of the University of California. It's called a climate justice credit. Mm. And, and she has been developing the criteria for that with indigenous peoples from mm. the heart of the Amazon. Mm. That kind of credit where, where there is rules for who can buy it. Mm and who can use it, and those rules are for essential use of existing fossil fuels, absolutely. We're not saying turn off the taps overnight, right? right? We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna use less fossil fuels and produce less fossil fuels as we wind it down. Mm -hmm. And we can do that, mm -hmm. and, and the numbers work, but not if we expand pollution. Right now, most of the credit schemes, if you look at the money behind it, they trace right back to the big, the big five oil companies, That's right. to Shell, et cetera. That's and right. they're using them as an excuse to expand mm. emissions and production. And that's why I think that that's very dangerous. Yeah, and, and, and the evidence is on your side. Like you said, I mean, we've been trying this approach over and over and we've given it, uh, you know, many years and emissions are going up. Yeah. And so, you know, clearly the impetus is on us to think differently and to really prove out new approaches. Well, but let's get to the thinking differently. Like, where do we want to go in the future? I don't disagree that we mm. need to support uh, communities to do things differently. We need to support communities to maintain ecosystem services, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the healthy forests that provide that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that there's, and that's absolutely critical. And so we can't expect, especially Global South governments, to be able to just say no to all extractive industries and not have anything to replace them. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are the new financial rules? How do we do that? How do we provide ascent incentives? Under the fossil fuel treaty, we're looking at um, tax incentives. We're looking at debt forgiveness. We're looking at debt climate swaps. And we're trying to, to develop rules around that so that countries can be supported to say no. Mm. to the extraction. Mm -hmm. 
as part of the work that I do with Stand Out Earth, we've been trying to convince companies to do exclusion zones for the most biodiverse places on Earth. Mm. So that's a way of of just getting the extraction out of there quickly. Mm -hmm. A lot of banks, for example, have exclusion zones already on the Arctic or on tar sands because it's so heavy carbon. Mm. So we've, de we've developed a, an exclusion zone for the Amazon, Amazon exit oil strategy. And we've now started taking that to banks. And last year, BNP Paribas was the first bank to agree with us. Wow. And they put a new policy on their oil trade and finance I mean, they, I, I believe they should have a policy saying they won't do any new fossil fuel uh, investments. Mm -hmm. They haven't got that far yet, mm -hmm. but they did agree to put in the, the first bank to put in the Amazon exclusion zone. And in doing that, they moved somewhere between seven to nine billion dollars of oil trade out of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. That sends a very strong political message. And I think other banks should be doing that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so the Stand Research Group has been doing significant financial research to understand who's doing the buying, who's doing the trading, who's doing the financing. Mm -hmm. And when they released that data, there were six European banks that didn't even know that they were doing oil trade in the, in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And they had climate policies and biodiversity policies and indigenous rights policies. Mm -hmm. But they're so big and they don't know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Right. So when we released that data, six European banks canceled their oil trade in the Amazon. Wow. As a result of that. Nice. So we need better transparency. We need the financial institutions to stop financing the extraction in the most biodiverse and most important places on earth. Mm -hmm. And and so that's part of the financial shift that needs to happen. But I think we also need governments, especially in the wealthy countries, to step up and finance communities to keep their forests standing. Right. And can you share more about that debt forgiveness and debt swaps and what, what that is and how that works? You know, honestly, the rules are just being created right now as mm -hmm. we start to look at it. But we do debt forgiveness and debt swaps all the time. Right. For COVID, there was billions of dollars of debt forgiveness. There's, there, there's agreements happen on that all the time. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the interesting thing for me has been looking deeply into the Ecuador situation. So Ecuador is drilling for more oil and mm -hmm. in fact saying that they're not going to respect the new moratorium on the Yasuni ITT mm -hmm. uh, decision that happened last month. So there was a democratic referendum saying, we don't want any more oil drilling in Yasuni National Park. Now Ecuador, the Ecuadorian government saying, well, sorry, we're going to keep drilling because we don't have a choice because this was a debt for oil swap with China. But meanwhile, other parts of the Chinese government have been declaring that they are, they have a life strategy, that they are prioritizing protection of biodiversity and climate change. And, and so, and they're spending billions on that strategy. So, so we need governments to actually be looking at, again, what is the right hand doing and talking to the left hand and saying, actually, rather than dumping money into new uh, funds to protect the Amazon, mm. why don't you stop forcing countries to extract in the heart of the Amazon. And, and so there are a number of academic institutions that are now looking at how do we develop the principles for debt swaps? How do you develop the principles for debt, debt, debt forgiveness? And, and I, and I think that, I think that there is a huge potential, especially given the focus that we're starting to see Mm -hmm. on, on reforming financial institutions as a result of the leadership of Mia Motley in Barbados and that whole financial um, uh, proposal that was put on the table last year. I think we're going to see a lot of reforms mm -hmm. in the coming, in the coming, in the next couple of years. Yeah, it seems exciting. I mean, it seems daunting because you, you can't control how these, these governments work together. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is kind of opaque and everything else, but the, but the sheer amount of funding that can get kind of rearranged on the chessboard through these multi-billion dollar debt swaps and these large scale protection and reserve strategies um, is the kind of scale that we need to be thinking at. Yeah. And there's, there, there's a lot of money out there, right? Right. Like the oil industry doubled their profits last year. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't there be some kind of profit tax mm -hmm. where we're taking it back for the damage that they've done? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and the damage that they're doing. You know, these companies are making billions in profits and they're walking away from leaking wells, from um, billions of dollars of cleanup, mm-hmm. and they're not being taxed on that. Mm-hmm. And and that's a whole other proposal that that we need to look at. And that's where governments can get their money or stop giving them money right. <laughs> in direct and indirect subsidies and redirect that money right. towards supporting countries in the global south, keeping it in the ground. Mm-hmm. And how, I mean, there's the the individual actors within these fossil fuel companies and their motives, intentions, tactics, and so forth. There's also the shareholders. And I think people often don't recognize how broad scale the shareholders of these public companies are through everyday investments, 401ks, mm-hmm. ETFs, and so forth. Help me understand how you think about that side of the system and how we might reform it. What's really fascinating is that there's been a number of reports that have come out this year looking at how much money would major pension funds have made if they divested 10 years ago. Mm. Because what's fascinating is that the companies themselves are making a lot of money. They're not passing it on to their Mm. shareholders. They're certainly not passing it on to the people who live in the regions where they're extracting. And that's a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. There's these arguments now for more drilling and more fracking and more gas projects all across Africa and Asia to help with development in the global south to turn the lights on. Fossil fuel industry has had 200 years to turn the lights on in many countries in Africa and Asia. and, and And they haven't because what they do instead is extract the project and export it for profit that goes to a very small group of people. Mm-hmm. And but back to your back to the to to the conversation um, at hand around the structure of the the profits, they're not being distributed uh, to um, to significant numbers of people. They're not being distributed to the shareholders. So when the Calpers, the California pension funds, did their study, they found that um, they would have made thirty percent. I think it was thirty percent more money for for the people in the pension fund if they had divested from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So I I think the most powerful signal we can send right now is to divest, to divest from fossil fuels entirely. And I think for a lot of pension funds um, and other major funds, they're going to make money doing that. Right. Take me through what's happening in California. You mentioned the court battles that Newsom has started uh, against the fossil fuel companies. I understand also California endorsed the fossil fuel treaty, which uh, just happened a few weeks ago. It was mm-hmm. a major win for the effort. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe paint us a picture of, of California and where it fits in the struggle. I think California was really one of the first jurisdictions in the world to recognize that they were going to have to figure out three things. Not only how to constrain emissions by putting in place policies that provided certainty to the marketplace to scale up Uh, new innovations, renewables, electric vehicles, infrastructure charging, heat pumps, et cetera. And they put in place solid policies. You know, they've been at the forefront of putting in place demand reduction policies. But more than that, about five years ago, they started exploring fossil fuel supply and how to constrain the supply of fossil fuels. And and I think they were one of the first jurisdictions to really look at that at all on Mm. the planet. And they started doing bans or moratorias on fracking or um, et cetera. And th- those have increased now over time. I think there's still some gaps there. You know, they don't have any regulation of uh, ramp downs associated with refineries, for example. So as California produces less oil and gas, the refineries in California are importing more from the Amazon. You know, our Stand Research has, Stand Out Earth Research is showing that. of everything that is uh, drilled in the Amazon and Ecuadorian Amazon is coming into California now. And so if you fly out of LAX today, one in five planes is on Amazon oil. It's, it's insane. So, so California still has work to do on the refinery ramp down, uh, et cetera. Uh, But they also, what I love about what's what California is doing right now is they understand the role of leadership at this moment in history. It's not just about the policies you put in place domestically, Mm. Because 
everyone's right now watching everyone else. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows we have to use less fossil fuels and we have to produce less fossil fuels in, in order to keep the earth safe, but they all want to be the last barrel sold. <laughs> and so there's this kind of jockeying right now. Well, if you're going to produce it, I'm going to produce it, and, you know, and, and which is mm. insane. And, and it's like a bad game of chicken with our lives, you know, but California has recognized that they need to be leaders and they're outspoken. So they were, you know, one of the first uh, economies to join the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, which was started by Denmark and Costa Rica. So this is countries and subnationals coming together to create a club of countries who are committed to constraining uh, oil and gas expansion. It's very similar in some ways to the treaty, except the fossil fuel treaty is not about what, what those countries or subnationals are doing in their own borders, mm -hmm. but how, we co how they cooperate to create new rules of global governance to help each other do it. Mm. So last month, California passed a motion in the Senate and the House to endorse the fossil fuel nonproliferation treaty and became the second state in the world to do that. Hawaii was the first. Mm -hmm. And as more states and cities join up and countries join up, it starts to create a momentum towards the treaty. So that's really critical. And then this week, uh, Governor Newsom announced that California is also going to sue the oil companies with a massive multi-million dollar lawsuit for damages. I mean, that's one way to get the profits back. And it also signals, it sends a very so strong signal to the world uh, that they've picked a side. Mm. For a long time, these companies have been convincing governments that they are part of the solution. We need them at the table to develop the ramp down, to develop the phase out. They're not going to manage their own decline. Mm. <laughs> we had to stop negotiating with them and start regulating them. Mm. And that's the signal that Newsom sent with this massive lawsuit. He said, I'm going to stand up to these bullies. And he's encouraging other countries to do that. And that and that leadership that California is showing, I think, is going to reverberate around the world. When the other side of a, of a struggle or a fight is not going to manage their own decline, there's still, I think, a question of how, what are the pathways forward for that other side? Is it, you know, lock them up in a cage incarceration? Is it death penalty? Is it, you know, finding win-win solutions? Like th there's, a, there's an array of whatever, uh, you know, sound bites we could use. I, I'm curious. They have to what get is, out of that business. Yeah. What is your vision for the future of the fossil fuel industry? There is no question that this is a sunset industry. It has to be, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't know. We didn't know when we started producing oil, gas, and coal and started designing our systems, our transportation systems, and our heating systems to be based on those three products that the cumulative use would threaten life on Earth. We didn't know. Right. We know today. So now we have to transition out of them. Those companies are not going to exist in the future. I think the big question is whether some of them can transform to be energy companies mm -hmm. like um, Orsted has done. So Orsted used to be called Dong Energy. They were an oil company. Now they're called Orsted and they're one of the largest producers of wind farms in the world. And, and they managed to do it. Most of the fossil fuel companies are not set up to do that and they're not designed to do that. And it will be very, very difficult for them structurally to mm -hmm. transfer that way. And, and so some of them are writing down. They're writing down their assets. They can see the writing on the wall and they know that they're going to have to get out of the business. Mm -hmm. And and we're starting to see that, especially with European companies, they're getting out of heavy oil first. Mm -hmm. So we saw a huge flight of um, European oil companies like Total uh, and others leaving the oil sands in mm -hmm. Canada, for example. They were heavily invested in the oil sands. Now they're not. Um, but unfortunately, we've seen a number of oil companies in the last year double down on increasing production. So why are they doing that when they know that the world's going to use less oil? 
because there's still quite a lot of money to be made for them. Right. And and so they want to they want to get those projects in. And let's not forget that the way those oil companies are designed, their senior management, especially their CEO bonuses, are based on whether or not they're increasing production. Mm -hmm. So these companies have a vested interest in increasing production. That's the bottom line. And so they're not really designed to transform themselves. The other thing we can't forget is that these are companies designed to make a profit based on owning the rights and controlling the rights to the product that is necessary to heat our homes and run our cars. Well, no one owns the sun and the wind. You can own the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You can own the wind turbine. You can own the solar panel. But by its nature, that energy system, a renewable energy system, has distributed power in every sense of the word power. <laughs> You're not concentrating the profits in one person or the 1%. You're not concentrating the production of power in one place. In fact, it's way more effective if it's distributed across a landscape. The interesting thing about that is that it's way more resilient than as well. Mm -hmm. So in Texas, when they had those ice storms or they had those heat waves or floods, what we're now noticing is that fewer people die when you have more renewable energy on the grid because it is a distributed power system. It's not so vulnerable. It's also not as vulnerable to dictators. And that's why Germany's response and Europe's response to Putin's war on Ukraine was not to double down in producing more fossil fuels, which is what the fossil fuel industry hoped. The first bombs had not even fallen mm -hmm. in Ukraine before the fossil fuel industry was out there saying, this is why we have to expand gas production in other countries. Right. They used that moment in a really disgusting way to try mm -hmm. and advance fossil fuel interests. But instead, what happened is a dramatic increase in renewable energy investment and into the investment uh, in electrification and heat pumps. So now Europe is less dependent on fossil fuels mm -hmm. because they realize that when you're dependent on fossil fuels, you're dependent on the whims of very few people. And that seems like a really key narrative that's being um, decided on right now is, is, you know, there's there's so many strong efforts to make fossil fuels be associated with energy independence and mm -hmm. resilience. And what you're suggesting is that actually the opposite is true. Yeah. Fossil fuels have never given people resilience. Fossil fuels have given us boom and bust economies. I, I'm from Canada. I've watched it happen in the last 50 years over and over and over again. The price goes up. More and more people being hired, the price goes down, everyone's being laid off, everyone's out of work. It's, it's a crazy roller coaster ride, and mm. that repeats all over the world. And who controls the price? You know, it's a very small group of people. And, and who controls the availability of that product? Again, a very small group of people. And so even when the price was so high at the pumps that people were worried about whether or not they could afford to drive to work, afford to heat their homes, record profits being made by the oil companies. So, you know, it, it's we need fairer, more equitable, distributed systems of energy production and use so that people, communities have more control over over the over the power systems that they need and that's renewable energy systems that's renewable distributed energy systems and and it, you know the amazing thing is that we can do it today and it's way cheaper we've seen a 70 to 90 percent drop in the price of concentrated solar battery storage and wind in the last 10 years Prices have been tanking as technolo technological advances have happened. And that's the exciting thing that we should be talking about is that we have the ability today to replace almost all of our fossil fuel uses and we have the ability to do it in a way that is much cleaner and much safer because, you know, what's a solar spill? It's just a sunny day, right? Mm. Yeah, I guess the the folks that 
are thinking about this from more of a post-growth or degrowth perspective might also want to caveat that if we just blindly go ahead with our 3% GDP growth per annum targets um, and say, oh, well, we're, now we're just going to replace all of our fossil fuel infrastructure with renewable energy infrastructure, that there's a tremendous amount of, of mining and extraction projects and deep sea mining and so on and so forth that still would be uh, involved in that kind of infrastructure transition. Yeah. Uh, what would you say to that? That's where we get back to the treaty. The third pillar of the treaty is fast tracking the just transition in an equitable way. Mm. And we need rules. We need rules and laws for international cooperation. We should have no go zones on this planet of where mining can happen. Mm. We can map it now. We know. We know where the most highest biodiverse places on the planet are. We know where the where the most critical forest ecosystems are. We know where the, the places where we have to protect what's left of the Earth's fresh water are. So we shouldn't be allowing mining there. And that mm -hmm. should be a, an agreement between countries. Mm -hmm. We should have rules and agreements between countries around a circular economy and around using the, the minerals that we've already dug up on Earth that are already in our landfills. And we should be uh, forcing the companies, the apples of the world, who are producing all these products that we use every day that have the precious minerals in them, to take them back and reuse them. Mm -hmm. And we don't have all those rules in place yet. So, so it, 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 we have to expand renewable energy, and electrification systems as quickly as we can. The most important thing we have to remember right now is every ton of carbon we, we, we save from going into the atmosphere will save lives. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. And we are in a race against the clock to bend the curve of carbon emissions. That has to be a priority. So we have to expand renewable energy and electrification systems. And, and while it's true that mining of anything has an impact on the planet, a human rights impact and an ecological impact. The mining of fossil fuels is the majority of the mining on the planet. So let's get rid of that. And let's also create rules mm. for the mining that we have to do for critical mineral minerals. Mm. So can you summarize then the fossil fuel treaty, those three pillars, and where are we at in terms of endorsements and adoption? Yeah. So the first pillar is to end expansion, non-proliferation. So commitments from all governments around the world to stop expanding oil, gas, and coal production. The second pillar is the agreements around the wind down. Who gets to produce and how much? So managing the wind down in a way that is fast, in a way that is fair, and financed. And the third pillar is around the just transition. How do we fast track the uh, the regenerative renewable revolution that needs to happen? And how do we make sure that we do that in a way that isn't out of the pan and into the fire? And, and, and creating the good rules around the transition. So those are the three pillars. We launched this idea three years ago at Climate Week, three years ago during COVID. And it feels a little bit like being shot out of a cannon Within a month, we had 101 Nobel laureates endorse, including the Dalai Lama. To date, we have 3,000 scientists from around the world that have endorsed the Fossil Fuel Nonproliferation Treaty. We have 2,500 institutions and organizations, everything from the largest faith institutions in the world, including cardinals from the Vatican, to the World Health Organization, a UN body has endorsed the Fossil Fuel Treaty. And we also have uh, commitments and endorsements now from 100 cities from around the world, two states. Last year at Climate Week, Vanuatu became the first country in the world to call for the Fossil Fuel Treaty fr from the floor of the UN General Assembly. They were quickly joined by, at COP27, uh, by Tuvalu, another Pacific Island nation. And over the past year, four other Pacific Island nations have joined them. So we have six Pacific Island nations. And as of this week, we also have Timor-Leste and Antigua and Barbuda. 
The exciting thing is that uh, just this week, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu hosted a high-level ministerial at the UN General Assembly. I can't tell you who was there, but it was prime ministers and ministers from 20 countries, countries in Latin America, Africa, and Europe, who were all starting to design the text and collaborating with each other to talk about what are the rules that need to happen under a fossil fuel treaty. And several of those countries have told us that they will publicly announce their support uh, for the idea of a fossil fuel treaty before the end of this year. Mm. Feels like a very important moment in time. Yeah, history is certainly upon us. Do you have any final words or messages you'd like to share and how do people get involved? This year, um, I was asked to come to the South Pacific. Vanuatu decided to hold a ministerial on fossil fuels, one of the first ever in the world. Two weeks before the ministerial, two cyclones hit Vanuatu and the country was put into a state of emergency. Thousands of people were in evacuation centers. Vanuatu is the most vulnerable place on earth to climate change. Their island is literally you know, projected at current rates of fossil fuel production to be completely underwater. I called up the minister and I said, Minister, I understand we're going to have to cancel the fossil fuel ministerial. How can we support you? And he said, no, we're opening the airport. For the ministerial. We have church groups and soccer teams who are cleaning up one of the resorts so you can come. I want you all to come here right now and see what our life is like now. And it was the most incredible thing I've ever been to. I mean, we were literally in a ministerial talking about how to stop the destruction that fossil fuels are causing while we could see the cleanup out the windows. And he said to me, for us, despair is not, is not an option. We're fighting, not drowning. And I thought about that a lot over the last couple of months. Despair is not an option. I thought about it when I couldn't go outside with my kids because of the wildfire smoke in Canada and how despair is such a privilege in a lot of ways because there are a lot of people who don't have that option. And, and so I... I think a lot, I think we should think about hope right now as a responsibility. Hope is our responsibility to, to create every day. We create it by picking up our pen or our petition or our placard. I find a lot of hope in the fossil fuel treaty because every day I hear about someone else who's organizing a new campaign on the fossil fuel treaty in another country. I met people yesterday from, from, from Turkey, from Ecuador, from Argentina. They're all organizing on the fossil fuel treaty. So people say to me, how can I, what can I do? Make it your own. We've created this idea, but you can campaign on it any way you want. It's an idea. And the more people who are working on this the, the more likely we are to get this groundbreaking treaty. Mm. And, and that's what keeps me going. That's what makes me hopeful is getting up every morning and putting on hope like a jacket and saying, this is what I'm going to do today. Mm. And it gives you a, a sense of purpose. So join us. Join us at fossilfueltreaty.org because you know we know that we are stronger when we are together. And we know that we need to do something different, something big that is bo and, and is bold. We know that. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to take courage. But what I felt in Vanuatu and what I think people will feel when they become a part of this movement is that courage, courage is contagious. Deborah Berman, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay, what do you think of that? Can you believe that the Paris Agreement did not even mention the words fossil fuels? Leave us a comment below. You can learn more about the Fossil Fuel Treaty at fossilfueltreaty.org, as well as Zipporah's other work at stand.earth. For more discussions like this one, including all of the conversations we had at New York Climate Week, just go to maearth.com 
Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.